Państwu. Witam serdecznie na kolejnym z wykładów z serii Ekonomia czasów kryzysu, których autorem, pomysłodawcą i moderatorem jest pan profesor Jerzy Osiatyński. Dziś mamy, dziś naszym, naszym gościem jest pan profesor Julio Lopez, którego bliżej przedstawi państwu profesor Osiatyński. Ja tylko powiem, że Profesor Lopez jest autorem jednej z najważniejszych monografii twórczości Michała Kaleckiego. Jest również jego studentem, gdyż w latach 60. pracował naukowo, uczył się w Polsce przez, przez dwa lata. A dziś będzie opowiadał o doświadczeniu swoistego eksperymentu gospodarczego, jaki spotkał kraje Ameryki Łacińskiej i, i, i nie tylko w ostatnich kilkudziesięcioleciach opowie również o konsekwencjach i o wnioskach i implikacjach dla polityki gospodarczej dziś. A tymczasem chciałbym oddać głos panu profesorowi Jerzemu Siedlińskiemu. Jeszcze przepraszam, tylko zupełnie ja oczywiście naszym partnerem jest Fundacja imienia Róży Luksemburg, tak jak w przy poprzednich wykładach i liczymy również, że Nasze wykłady będą kontynuowane. Myślę, że o, 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 o szczegółach będą, będziemy mogli Państwa poinformować już niedługo, a ze względów inwigilacyjno informacyjnych chcielibyśmy Państwa poprosić o wpisanie się na listę obecności. Czy tak, to długopis mogę przekazać? A tymczasem przekazuję głos Panu Profesorowi Jerzemu Świeckim. Good evening, everybody. I feel privileged to introduce tonight not only a distinguished economist, but a friend and a dedicated student of Michael Collette. I think it's nearly a shame to mention when we met New York. <laughs> uh, I was young. We were both. Uh, I think we were mid 60s. Um, uh, both postgraduates. Julio you studying under Kaletsky on economic developments and uh, capitalist, the dynamics of capitalist economy, while I was more concentrated on central planning and uh, economic functioning of a central planned economy. Uh, Professor Lopez spent most of his professional career in uh, Latin American countries, mainly in his uh, native Mexico. But his, uh, his research goes well beyond uh, the problems of uh, development of Latin America or underdeveloped economics. Economics. Economic. Uh, while the main subject of his tonight's presentation is the case study of Mexico. And it is an important case study because in many ways it was a orthodox prescription of mainstream economics, of policies that were enforced with the idea that they would warranty long-run full capacity employment in countries that followed those recommendations. 
He will tell you tonight. How very untrue, unfounded that claim has been. Now we know that that claim has been applied and is being applied presently in the crisis striking countries of the European Monetary Union, in many emerging economies, also in Poland, where the European Commission enforces a strong adjustment program, which means austerity, austerity, austerity. This year, we are expected to reduce the structural deficit by anything between 0.4 up to 0.6 percentage points of GDP. Next year, another 0.6. Now, if you remember that those percentages need to be referred to what is the elastic part of public spending, not the public spending of local and central government, but we need to remember that about 80% of that spending is something that we do not have any decision on, like subsidies to local governments, like servicing public debt, like social spending for retirement, old pension, old age pensions, and so on. So those cuts need to the tune of anything between 18 up to 22, 24 billion dollars of GDP need to be related to some 90 billion of spending that you have some freedom and you can manipulate with it. This is very hard and of course it will have negative impact on GDP rate of growth of unemployment rates and all the rest of it. I'm telling you this because although Julio will be explaining how that operated in the context that is his everyday experience and the suffering of the people, of his people, this is also our problem, our challenge. And I think it is very important that we see what conclusions we should draw from the experience of Mexico and some other countries that you know will be talking about. You can know, the floor is yours. You have the mic. I, I, I thank you very much. It is a great honor to be here. Uh, invited by the teacher, by the teacher, and to be again in Warsaw, in Poland, the city where I took my PhD studies, which I remember a lot, with a great uh, team, and which uh, I like very much, except for it being too cold. But uh, I had forgotten how cold it can be here. Anyway, I'm glad. I have, I have had a nice time strolling and 
recollecting memories. And uh, it is a great honor, especially being invited by Professor Oshatinsky, who dared to mention the, the moments when we met, when the majority of those of we who were not alive, not, not even thinking in coming into the world. But such is life. Now, uh, the topic I am going to deal with now is uh, the, the modernization strategy which has been implemented in most Latin American economies and particularly in the Mexican economy, which is where I have been working for the last 35 years. Uh, uh, the modernization strategy is, has many, many aspects it, it has, on the one hand, a transformation of the trade strategy, meaning by that the opening up of the economy uh, to trade. On the other hand, there, is, uh, there has been an important drastic reform concerning the financial sector, which was a sector which was very much controlled up until the mid-80s, and which was totally opened after the reform. And there has been also a reform of the macroeconomic policy, meaning by that especially how the man management was carried out. All those, uh, <coughs> all those uh, topics are covered to a, to a large extent in a paper which is available for you. It is a very technical paper, but uh, I am not going to be technical, or I will try not to be very technical in my talk because uh, I presume that most of you are not economists and do, do not need to know our jargon or our way of saying things. I would try, try rather to give you a, over a brush picture of the main aspects involved, uh, emphasizing one particular point which is uh, very important and which I was told might be more interesting to you. This point is uh, the liberalization and deregulation of the financial sector. Uh, if time allows us, which probably it will not, I, we might go also into the aspect related to trade liberalization, which is another important reform carried out in Mexico and I think it also has been carried out here in Poland. Anyway, for starters, I will, uh, I will speak about financial modernization, which are, well, the story runs more or less like this. Uh, it is said that in, a can in any country, which is close to international finance, uh, it does not take advantage of the possibilities international finance brings <coughs> about. And therefore, it should open to international finance because that will allow it to raise the level and, and, and rate of savings and investment. And this also this meaning a financial liberalization and deregulation will make investment more efficient. So that it is expected that financial modernization will abolish pre-existing financial repression, interest rates will be raised, uh, higher interest rates will uh, increase, will, uh, will stimulate private savings, foreign funds 
will be attracted to the country and foreign savings will grow and total saving and investment will rise. This is the basic idea underlying this. See, it is the form. Now, uh, I will skip here the details about that. I will only say for the reference that until the middle of the 80s, Mexico's financial sector was very much controlled in the sense that the central bank set interest rate and the credit and credit was regulated through a series of measures. There was a complex system of reserves, preferential lending rates for specific specific uh, sectors of activity, so that. Uh, financial institution could not freely set their interest rates and could not freely uh, uh, allocate uh, credit to sectors but was the, the, they had to follow certain uh, certain uh, strict uh, measures now all this was reformed on the one hand the internal way of operation of the financial system was liberalized and deregulated, uh, set a uh, interest rate set by the central bank were more or less abolished. The central bank set its interest rate, but banks could set their interest rate for uh, the active and the passive interest rate. And the mandatory reserve coefficient was drastically reduced and finally was eliminated. This is more or less the story which you can read in the, in the, in the, in, in the slides here. And uh, what was it? What? So this was, refer in, in, this was a reform of the way in which the financial system operated within the country why at the same time there was a financial liberalization towards foreign, foreign inflows and outflows of funds. By the way, unlike uh, most Latin American economies, Mexican economy was had, 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 never had control of capital movements, but a regulations did exist, which somewhat implied a certain degree of control among, uh, uh, on capital movement. All this was, as I say, it was more or less uh, eliminated in the mid, uh, on the end of the eighth. What were the consequences of this? So, uh, on the one hand, if, you, if we look at the whole picture, what, what was happening? On the one hand, growth which has had been uh, stagnating, the Mexican economy has been stagnating between uh, the beginning of the 80s and the end of the 80s. Uh, at the end of the 80s, at the very, at, at the very late uh, years of the 80s, growth resumed at a relatively modest now, on the other hand, the elasticity of demand in ports grew very rapidly. And uh, Mexico, in any case, was following what, what was called, what is called today, the Washington Consensus Strategy, so that the financial opening and the trade opening of the country was very much encouraged by the foreign, uh, very, uh, very much uh, praised by the international financial press and by international financial institutions. So, uh, more or less the country was developing at a slow pace. Now, but let me see more, more in detail the consequences of this opening and the regulation of financial flows into Mexico.
Now, we have here the evolution of the credit to the private sector, which this is more or less uh, 1984, and this is 1994. There was a rise in the credit to the private sector, And on the other hand, the lending real interest rate did not change much. Now, uh, the money multiplier and the credit to the GDP ratio rose, meaning by that that the private sector started receiving much larger funds to operate. In particular, look, look here, the ratio of the credit to the GDP ratio. This is an important indicator regarding how, uh, how finance is being made available to the private sector by the banking sector. Uh, now, here we have also the evolution of GDP and the money multiplier. See here, the this was the evolution of GDP prior to the reforms, and this is the evolution of GDP after the reforms. There was indeed a rise. Uh, in the uh, rate of growth of the economy. Now, here you have uh, the lending interest. This is the rate of interest of the government uh, bonds here, which is declining. And here you have a, a, a very interesting uh, additional feature of the development of the economy during the period. Here you have the evolution of the real exchange rate. Look, the real exchange rate here uh, I am using here the definition which is used uh, here, I think, in, 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 in Europe. Uh, this is an appreciation of the currency. So, due to the inflow of funds, due to the inflow of funds, a phenomenon which occurred was that since interest rates in Mexico were higher than interest rates abroad, and especially they were higher than interest rates in the United States, financial investors came to Mexico, came to the country. So the country was receiving enormous inflows of foreign currency. Now, uh, inflow of foreign currency brought about an appreciation of the currency. You see, this is external savings. This is the inflow of funds which came as I said, as a consequence of interest rate being higher in Mexico than abroad, especially higher than the United States. Okay? So funds came to the, to the country, and this brought about appreciation of the, in, 
of the real exchange rate. So the peso, which is our national currency, was becoming more and more overvalued due to the inflow of foreign funds. Now, Here you have uh, more or less the same, the same story. This is the capital account balance of the, of, of, the, uh, of the country. This is red. So capital account means inflow of funds, basically. And here you have appreciation in blue, appreciation of the real exchange rate. Now, appreciation of the real exchange rate provokes as a lot of effects in the country. One of the effects it provokes is a trade imbalance, namely External savings means that the country is receiving more than it is selling abroad. If you know what I mean. So, in, as, uh, due to the appreciation of the, the currency, Mexico it lose, loses competitiveness. So, it is importing more than it exports. This is the first important consequence of the inflow of foreign currency into the country, namely appreciation of the currency, loss of competitiveness, and trade deficit. Now, uh, this is this development also bring up, brings about the following. In, uh, in spite of the trade balance being more and more negative, the appreciation of the currency has some important additional effects. One of the effects it has is that real wages grow because foreign goods become cheaper. Purchasing power of wages rises and Simultaneously, the, 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 the wage share rises. This brings about a rise in the demand, in internal demand, brought about by an increase in the purchasing power of workers and in workers' demand. So we have one effect on demand which is negative, which is the fact that imports rise and the country is losing purchasing power which is spent abroad, this means reduction of demand. On the other hand, we have some factors which push up internal demand. One of these factors is the rise in the purchasing power of wages and an increase in the de work in workers' demand and, pro tanto, in domestic demand. On the other hand, an additional factor which takes place when the economy is a very open one is the fact that 
entrepreneurs which are indebted in foreign currency have to pay less interest for their indebtedness because the price of the dollar is, is, is falling. I don't know if you understand the point which is, I try, I, I try not to make it very technical, but imagine the following. You are a Polish entrepreneur and uh, you have taken, you have uh, taken loans in the uh, euro market. So, and you are paying a certain amount of slots each month. Because you have that, that in dollar, you have to, to turn your, your slots into dollars, in, into euros, and you have to pay your debt. What happens when the slot, when the purchasing power of the slot rises? So you have to, you have to spend less slots to pay your debt. So this is what was happening in Mexico and as a consequence the indebtedness, the, 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 the share of indebtedness of firms um, specified in domestic currency declined because the euro is cheaper. Therefore, this tends to stimulate firms to invest. And this causes a rise in domestic demand. Now, so the picture, the picture I'm trying to, to tell you is that you have on the one hand a uh, leaking away of demand due to higher imports on the one hand, because of, of, the, of the currency being overvalued, and on the other hand, you have some uh, factors which push up domestic demand because of the rise in the purchasing power of wages and in the uh, stimulus to invest which domestic firms are receiving because they are paying less slots in debt. The, 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 the combinations of these two factors is here shows that in fact aggregate demand tends to rise when the currency appreciates. This is what is shown here. Now so the economy is growing, there is, uh, there is a stimulus to growth due to the appreciation of the currency. The economy is growing, but since the, um, since you are losing competitiveness because of the appreciation of your currency, you are, you are uh, having a problem with your external accounts because your trade deficit is growing and growing. That is, the appreciation of the currency on the one hand tends to stimulate the domestic demand and on the other hand tends to bring about higher and higher trade deficits. Now, on the other hand, uh, so this is, this is a kind of evolution which, is, which, is, which has one, I would say, a nice side to it, which is the fact that it is, it is stimulating demand, but on the other hand, it is having a very bad consequence from the point of view of your, of your external situation because you are being, being you are having a growing 
trade deficits with the countries you are, you, you are, you are trading with. So, on the other hand, there is a very, a very uh, important aspect here, which is present in, 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 this, uh, in this graph. You have here the, do the dollar price of shares, and you have here the real exchange rate. Now, the real exchange rate is appreciation, appreciating, and obviously the dollar price of share is rising. Suppose you are a foreign, a foreign uh, investor who is buying shares in Mexico or in Poland for that matter. So you are buying share, you, you, you are printing in money, you, uh, as you are bringing money, as many foreign investors are bringing in money, your currency is appreciating. But you are bringing money here with a certain purpose. You are bringing money not to only to buy things, but to buy assets. For example, shares from firms. When you, are bring, when you are buying shares, uh, you pay a certain amount of dollar sales or euros for each share. If shares, the price of share, due to the rise in the price of the domestic currency, the price of your share in dollars tend to increase. You bought a share which you, you paid 100 euros for the share and the price you are getting converting the share rises in terms of euros because you bought the share in slots. For example, you bought the share for 100 slots and say it is one, one per one euro. If the slot rises and it costs, uh, and, and, it, uh, and the euro falls in price due to the uh, inflow of funds, you are going to receive more euros due to the appreciation of your currency. So you are going to get a capital gain I don't know if the picture is, is clear enough. But you are, good, you, are, you are buying the share, which costs $100, and the share, after six months, is going to cost $110. It, it, this is the price, because your currency is appreciating, and the share is valued in domestic currency. So you are having a capital gain, and the capital gain is taking place, taking place because of the inflow of foreign funds into the country. Now, since this is happening, since the capital gain is taking place, you are going to keep on bringing funds into the country. So, you want, you came here in January, you brought certain amount of money. In June, due to the appreciation of the currency, it turned out that you had a capital gain. In June, you bring in more money. Bringing in more money brings in brings in fact with it another currency appreciation. So you have a situation in which is, there is a, a capital gain which attracts foreign funds, which bring about appreciation of the currency, which bring about capital gain, which bring us about capital inflow, which bring about appreciation of the currency, and so on and so forth. So you have a parallel process in which, on the one hand, you are having uh, 
have uh, capital inflows which are bringing about appreciation of the currency, which are bringing about trade deficit, which are, are bringing about capital gains. And you have this two process parallel developing. On the one hand, you have this capital gain here, and you are having at the same time capital account balance here. This is an expression of the trade imbalance, the trade deficit. This is an expression of the trade. This is the, 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 the expression of the trade deficit. So you are having, and here, foreign saving, this is the saving of foreigners in, in, in the country. Foreign saving is rising because you are, you are spending more than what you are. You are spending abroad more than what foreigners spend, spend into, your country, into your country. So this is the evolution of the current account deficit here, which is uh, the foreign saving. So you have, you, and you have a certain rise in private investment, much, a much, much larger rise in your uh, current account deficit. You, so you are having also a certain growth in GDP, but you have an unsustainable situation. Now, a situation in which the economy is growing at a certain modest rate, uh, and which is accompanied by an increasing trade deficit, and by an increasing financial fragility, Meaning by that, a situation in which you are uh, increasingly getting into foreign debt because you are not exporting as much as you are spending in imports is a situation which is going to last until the moment when foreign creditors are willing, are going to be willing to extend further and further credits to you. So, a situation of financial liberalization in Mexico brought about a situation in which foreign or in which inflows of foreign funds brought about appreciation of the domestic currency, a modest economic recovery, and increasing indebtedness of the country and at the same time an increasing financial fragility in which by, by which I, I want to denote a situation whereby you are producing less foreign currency which you export than the foreign currency you are using for your imports. And this is a type of situation which is generating a, an internal loop which feeds back on itself because foreign, because uh, funds coming into the country bring about an appreciation of the currency and at the same time bring about capital gains 
for financial for foreign financial investors, which stimulate further inflow of foreign currency into the country. Now, this type of situation uh, is a, a situation which is uh, which is doomed to bring about at a certain moment a change, a drastic change maybe even in the situation because at a certain point you are you, you, your level of debt is going to be seen as excessive from the point of view of operators in foreign currency. Now, uh, for example, here, this, this uh, line here, which is the, uh, the current, current account deficit, reached a level more or less equivalent as 7% of GDP. Now, of course, nobody knows when this type of situation is going to uh, lead foreign investors to stop lending because ultimately the, the, the country seems to be more or less in good shape uh, or may, may seem to be in good shape since people is investing but uh, when, 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 uh, when a degree of financial fragility of high financial fragility is reached, then foreign investor may lose confidence in the country if certain situations tend to develop. Now, uh, in Mexico, the situation, the view, the favorable view Mexico attracted uh, in the foreign press and in foreign and international financial institution lasted until more or less the, the beginning mid-1994. So financial opening and financial, financial liberalization and deregulation began more or less at the end of the 80s. In 1994, the, the country had reached a point where the degree of uh, the, 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 the share of the trade uh, uh, deficit or the, the current account deficit had reached more or less 7% of GDP and this was already a very high rate of uh, deficit uh, as regards the level of GDP and this more or less tended to provoke a uh, change of attitude of foreign investors. Foreign investors started losing confidence of the country. The country had to raise persistently the rate of interest paid to foreign investors. But uh, and the, 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 uh, uh, an important change took place in the composition of, uh, of the current account in the sense that short-term lending gain weight and long-term lending declined. So the country was in a situation in which the degree of indebtedness and especially short-term indebtedness was extremely high and the country was in a situation of a very high degree of financial fragility. Now, in the course of 1994, some international and domestic events took place which provoked a drastic change in the situation. On the one hand, interest rates in the United States started to grow which made much more attractive for international capital to invest foreign funds, to invest funds 
in the United States and make Mexico a less attractive place where to invest. In the second place, the event which, which took place were related to the political situation. There was the Zapatista uprising on the one hand, and there was the assassination of two important political figures of the political uh, of the of the dominant political party in Mexico, so that this caused a drastic decline in, uh, in, in foreign lending to the country. Let me find the picture. This is a capital account balance here, which indicates more or less what the country is receiving. It was growing until this moment and it declined drastically. So foreign investors decided to take the investment out from Mexico, not, not lending any more to Mexico. This was a very drastic change of opinion. And this forces the government. What the, the consequences of this were of different types. On the one hand, since the exchange rate had been appreciating due to the inflow of funds, the withdrawal of funds from of foreign funds from Mexico implied less availability of foreign currency and brought about immediately a rise of the exchange rate. The exchange, the exchange rate was about, uh, say, uh, one and a half peso per dollar. In a course of 15 days, it came to 250 peso per dollar. So it was a drastic depreciation of the currency and the depreciation of the currency brought about immediately a rise in prices an acceleration of inflation the rate of inflation which was about 5% uh, at the end of 94 came to 50% in 1995 a drastic depreciation of the currency a drastic reduction in the purchasing power of the population because wages were not raised while prices were growing. The precision of the currency also brought about a tremendous increase in the debt service of firms indebted in dollars. For example, if you were a businessman who had to, who had to pay, who had, a, who had a, a service of the debt equivalent to say three million dollars per month, after the currency depreciation had to service the debt for three millions per month, but now, since the currency has depreciated about 100%, 100%, about 100%, had to pay for service of the debt twice as much as it was paying before currency depreciation, so that this brought about a drastic worsening of the uh, of the uh, balance sheet of firms which had debt in dollars, namely most of Mexican firms had taken debt in dollars because the interest rate for lending in dollars was much lower than the rate of interest for, for, uh, for debt 
uh, incurred in domestic currency. So this was a, 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 an important uh, change worsening of the balance sheet of firms and this provoked a drastic decline in investment. So what you had was on the, hand, on, the, on the one hand a drastic rise in prices and in inflation rate on the other hand, a drastic decline in the purchasing power of the population and a drastic decline in the workers' consumption and you have, a, on, uh, in the third place, a drastic worsening of the balance sheet of firms which had debt in dollars and a drastic de uh, decline in private investment, in domestic private investment, so you have a condition a, 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 very, a very great crisis. So this is here. Let me show you the picture. So here you have the consequence of the crisis was this a fall of GDP taking place at the end of 94 and 95, which amounted to about 6.5% of GDP in one year. So, to summarize, you have a situation in which you open your uh, financial sector. Opening of financial sectors seems to be a very nice history because you have a flow of funds coming into the country. You have appreciation of your currency. You are having a certain increase in the purchasing power of the workers. You are having a improvement in balance sheet of firms because those firms indebted in foreign currency have to service the debt with a, a, a an appreciating currency and you are having also a feedback uh, of the uh, of the in, of the currency inflow into itself because invest foreign investors investing in Mexico are uh, getting a, a, are receiving a capital gain thanks to the appreciation of the currency which the capital inflow itself is bringing about. Now this situation is, has another fate, uh, another dark side, which is that the currency appreciation is making you lose competitiveness and is bringing about uh, increasing, uh, uh, an ever increasing trade deficit but nobody is paying much attention to this because everything seems to be okay, because the country is growing, because expectations are very, very favorable, because uh, investors and balances of firms are in good shape, and because investors, foreign investors are receiving the capital gain. So nobody is paying much attention to the consequences of the trade deficit, on the, on, on the international competitiveness, and on the, uh, on the uh, balance sheet of the country, which is reflected on the trade, uh, on the counter counter deficit. And this situation is lasting, is lasting, is lasting because it has its own feedback. Investor bringing money into the country are getting a capital gain thanks to the inflow of guns. Now, this situation where you have having a, a balanced beneficial development, everybody is very happy, you are not having much inflation, you are having a currency which is appreciating, you are having a certain degree of development, has the dark side which is the external imbalance. The external imbalance is going to last until international investors see 
perceive that the situation is nice. But you are, since you are, you are, you are walking in a path uh, with a very high finan international financial fragility, if the international situation changes, or if the internal situation changes, and you have a shock, this shock will bring about with it a transformation of the way in which your economy is being conceived as, in the sense that if international investors perceive that you are not as that investing into your country is not as nice as it seemed to be, they are going to withdraw the funds. And if they withdraw the funds, the situation collapses and you get into a sort of this situation. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you could come to conclusions, because we would also like to get some question and answer. This is the conclusion. Okay. The conclusion here is the red line here. So everything is beautiful until it explodes. Financial fragility can easily explode. And so the, the, the main point of this, on the one hand, you have a situation which tends to perpetuate itself because it is feeding back into itself. Because people investing is having capital gain, but this brings about financial fragility, and financial fragility is a situation where any shock may provoke a disruption and turn everything into bad shape. And this is the bottom line. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now we come to questions and answers. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, yes. My name is Hans Peter. Um, uh, uh, exactly this situation which you said, that and everything is all right and then it explodes. I am waiting to explode already for 30 years. And there was a crisis situation in Brazil some 30 years ago, in this Punta uh, Frank time and so on. We all always waited until the situation explodes. But it never had. On the end, uh, it's well point. But because I have my, I have doubts whether it makes same sense to make an analysis, analysis of the economic situation, not taking it on the same in the same moment with the political situation in the country, because we have the same picture nearly in all of these Latin American countries on the whole. We have, we have uh, mostly we have one one sector of exports, copper in Chile, coffee in Brazil, Salvador, Venezuela, we have oil. It was very interesting for me, by the way, that you didn't mention the oil sector uh, in, in, in Mexico, in which role it had. But that's, that's another point. But if you don't, because as you say, the winners are the capital owners. And there's always one sector of population in these countries which is winning, and they don't care a day, a, 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 for nothing whether the country is going up and down and so on. Because, for example, it is always the same fact that the external debt of a country is nearly always the same amount as these elites in a country have on their accounts in other countries. In Brazil, it was, the same, it was 200 billion of dollars those days. And exactly the same 200 billions of dollars were on the Florida accounts of the same edit there, which was reinvested in this country. It was not even such an external import of capital. It was exactly the Brazilian, the edit import of capital. The same people, just it was meant to be outside capital. So, and to which, to, to which extent one question I have more? This is really because we have a, we have a broad uh, illegal sector in all these countries. Like in Peru, you have 70%. But 
to which point what you said of, of wages by Gaps and Town and so on is really effective by most of the people. That it has an impact or not. Look, uh, of course, I was not speaking of explosion in the Gunther Frank sense, uh, but more, but much narrower. I, but I, but I mean by breakdown of the situation is when a certain type of growth is not feasible anymore. Uh, and not meaning by that that a drastic political change is going to take place. I am not referring to that. I am very much more narrow the point. I mean, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is rather that you, you liberalize finance then if you liberalize vis-a-vis -vis your international sector, you are going, you, well, it is normally done because it is expected that this is going to bring about much more growth. That, that is, saving and investments are going to rise. Now, in Mexico's situation, this is not what took place. Rather, what took place was, was, was the, 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 the country indebted its, itself more and more, and at a certain moment, the debt became untenable because foreigners, which were investment, in, investing into the country, found that the inflow of funds was not matched by a capacity large enough to produce the foreign currency needed to pay the debt. So it is much more narrow what I am talking about. Next question. Coach. I can say that uh, you can have to remember about the economy in the bottom of all this, meaning that if uh, currency is price is increasing, it means you are killing exports, but still you are at the same time killing the possibility to sell internal goods because internal produced goods are going higher in price. If you can't export and can't sell in, in, in your country, it means you are killing the customers because they can't buy, because they have no wages. Domestic uh, enterprises have to shut down because they can't sell anywhere. That's another point which means that it doesn't have been political crisis. Uh, economy is enough. In fact, this is the other part of the situation. If you if your currency is being is becoming overvalued. You see, uh, in Mexico's experience, overvalue, uh, the, the, the over overvalue of the currency, I mean, peso getting more expensive in terms of dollars, has a positive impact on overall demand. Demand is growing. I do not mean to imply that in every country is the same. But in particular experience of Mexico, currency appreciation tends to stimulate demand. Because it stimulates domestic demand more than it destimulates external net demand. I mean, domestic demand grows more than what you are losing because of your trade deficit. 
Now, not every country has the same type of situation. In other countries, currency appreciation may bring about a decline in aggregate demand. In Mexico's case, what I have studied shows me that it is the other this way. Okay? My question is actually quite simple. Uh, do you think that anywhere in the European Union is it politically feasible to take steps against financial liberalization? Because from the point of view of many people, they see just the factors like the GDP growth, the appreciation of currency, which seem positive. And if you take some steps against financial liberalization, it's not positive from the point of view of most of the investors. And probably in the following years, the GDP may fall and all the other negative consequences of the outflow of foreign capital may occur. Therefore, the political party which takes steps against the liberalization may not be popular at all. So is there actually like any solution out of uh, this problem, like, I think, I don't know, maybe the problem is the investors and stuff. We say foreign investors and we don't actually analyze who the foreign investors are. Maybe if we focus on like different kinds of investors, like long-term investors, maybe investors from the developing countries, the situation will be different. You see, there is, there is a it all depends, of course, in the, in, in the uh, Eurozone countries, it cannot be done. In countries not in the Eurozone countries, of course, it, it could be done. In any case, let me start from the very, very, from the very, uh, from, from first principles. The decision to have or not to have freedom of capital movements it's not something which is stated by God. I mean, this is a political decision, can be made. So, and the, the, the political feasibility, it of course depends on different countries. In countries not in the Eurozone, of course, measures could be, could be taken. And uh, in Latin America, we have had experiences for example, Chile introduced a tax on capital inflows which discriminated between different types of capital inflows. This was also made, uh, there is literature on this, on this point, a relatively large literature. Uh, also, this was uh, taken this took place in Colombia and this took place in Brazil. Uh, there was not a prohibition of capital inflows to come, but it was a tax. And capitals were taxed, taxed according to how long they remained in the country. And they did this is a very important discrimination because for capitals, just volatile type of capitals, you can put a very high rate of taxation. Then for capital coming for long term investment, you, so you can discriminate. Now, uh, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard of this type of. Uh, of uh, measures being taken in European countries not members of the Eurozone, such as this case, such, as, such as Poland, for example. Uh, the available uh, research done on capital flows and control of capital flows through taxation in the countries I just mentioned, suggest that this 
measures have had positive consequences in the sense that they have made those countries less prone to receive volatile type, types of foreign investment. Now, of course, we are talking here of a subject in which facts uh, are very important and the state of public opinion in a certain moment may be very important. Now, we are living in a moment of our history in which everything seems to be, liberalization seems to be uh, the best of all the worlds. I am not of this point of view, but the public opinion is more or less in this sense. So I think politically it is, uh, it, it, is it, it, it should be preceded by uh, education of the public opinion. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more uh, questions, and anyway, I think we need to be coming to, to the end of this meeting. Uh, I would like to make another comment regarding your question, the, the last question. I think it's the problem of speculative capital. And the more all of us say as households, and moreover, the more of capital accumulation in the sense of undistributed profits is not reinvested in fixed capital, but is also located into financial or other assets. <coughs> there is a clear drive that in a sense we all become less entrepreneurial, less entrepreneurial in the entrepreneurial sense, and more and more capital speculators. But of course, you may say, there must be some actual economic activity on which you can speculate. There must be some production, or else natural resources. So, of course, I can imagine there will be more and more speculation on fresh water or, or, or other mineral resources, uh, open space, and so on and so forth. But I don't think <coughs> that that system is socially and politically uh, state and uh, sustainable because the more of resources is spent on those uh, casino type operations and less into investing in fixed assets and generating true wealth the greater there will be unemployment, the, the greater will be polarization of incomes, something that we see practically everywhere, although, or nearly everywhere, <coughs> excuse me, although with very intense. So it's, of course, very difficult to predict how long that will last, I think actually it may last still another number of decades. I'm, as you can see, rather pessimistic about it. But on the other hand, when you look at the volumes, the rates of unemployment uh, in uh, the most developed capitalist countries of the European Union, of the monetary Union, 
I'm not sure that the situation can last as long as that. So this is first comment. The second comment, and I think this is uh, more optimistic in a sense, is related to the main subject of Julio's presentation tonight. I remember at the government meeting in early 1990 actually, or late 90 or early 91. Uh, and that was of course under the pressure of the IMF, World Bank and so on. The argument was used that the trade balance, foreign trade balance, was no longer relevant. You must not be concerned with trade deficit. What is important is your current account. Inflow of speculative capital, which was called also investments, portfolio investments, or similar terms were used. Of course, when your fiscal stability is to be founded on that type of speculative inflows or outflows and disparity of rates of interest, there are systemic risks, huge systemic risks that we all, with lots of pain, discovered in the 2007-2008 crisis. Not that much in Poland, <coughs> but to some extent as well. So what I can see also within the European Monetary Union, Economic and Monetary Union, is a compact, a recognition that equilibrium on your trade balance is important. That you mustn't found your financial stability on current account equilibrium, precisely because of those systemic risks implied in interest rates disparities and the mechanisms that were explained by Julio earlier in his presentation. So I think we will probably see also within the European Union, we already see it that there are more and more, there is more and more attention given to macroeconomic financial stability and systemic risks. And I think we will see, as we see at present, when so much talk you hear about the need to improve the competitive position of individual countries. What does it mean? That you need, by the virtue of improving your competitive position, to improve your export potential and perhaps substitute for your imports. So this is the balance of trade equilibrium, not current account. Not financial operations. Yes, they are important. They may be important to buy time, to modernize your industry, to restructure your economy. But it is the equilibrium, I think, in your trade account. Can I just ask, because if you don't have a private saving, household saving, and I think it's very 
Moses in Mexico. They don't have private, private household savings. So what can you do? How can you escape? <coughs> that's why it's a the point. The point is that savings are not are an ephemeral type of concept. Savings are a function of income. And income is a function of investment. So if there is too little investment in the private sector, you need to stimulate public investment to generate income that would generate savings that would help private save sector to, to improve its private savings and therefore bring in more of, if I may say so, spontaneous growth generated by the private sector. That would be my answer. Okay. Uh, I wanted you to, to, to join me in, in, in thanking Professor Julio Lopez for his presentation. And as it was earlier mentioned by Michal, as soon as we know the, 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 the time schedule and the names of, of, of other guest lectures that we will have next term, we will get in touch with you. And again, thanks a lot, Julio, and thank you for coming for, for tonight's presentation. Thank you.